In this session, we were talking about esophageal cancer. So we're going to talk about what are some of the risk factors for actually getting this condition. We're also going to talk about signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So esophageal cancer is a carcinoma or a cancer of the esophagus. So the esophagus is the upper portion of the gastrointestinal tract that connects the mouth to the stomach and it allows passage of food from the mouth into the stomach. Now, there are actually two types of esophageal cancer or two main types. There is another type of cancer of the esophagus, but it is more rare. And we're not going to talk about that in this lesson, but these are the two main types. One is known as squamous cell carcinoma and the other one is adenocarcinoma. So these are the two types of esophageal cancers. Now, what is the epidemiology of esophageal cancer? Esophageal cancer is more likely to occur in male patients. So males outnumber females three to one. And the onset of esophageal cancer occurs later in life. Generally speaking, between the ages of 55 to 60 is when we see most cases of esophageal cancer occurring. Now, there are some geographical differences in incidence of these two types of cancers. So for instance, in North America, the incidence of squamous cell carcinoma has actually decreased substantially over the last few decades. However, the incidence of adenocarcinoma has increased due to Barrett's esophagus. We're going to talk a bit more about this later on in this lesson. And in other parts of the world, we see higher incidences of squamous cell carcinoma, particularly in Asia, where we can see high levels of squamous cell carcinoma. And in individuals who actually do get esophageal cancer, it is a very poor prognosis with low survival rates. Now let's talk briefly about the pathogenesis behind each of these two types of esophageal cancer we talked about before. So the first one is going to be squamous cell carcinoma. So squamous cell carcinoma is a cancer of squamous cells. And this type of cancer is more likely to affect the upper portions of the esophagus. And what we can normally find is that the mid portion, so upper and mid portions of the esophagus are more likely to be affected by squamous cell carcinoma. And squamous cell carcinoma itself often begins as a plaque or a small outgrowth of cells. And this can lead to squamous cell carcinoma, again, in the upper portions more often than the other type of cancer called adenocarcinoma. Now, adenocarcinoma is a cancer that affects more often the lower third of the esophagus. And many cases of adenocarcinoma are caused by Barrett's esophagus. We briefly mentioned this before. Barrett's esophagus is where there's a metaplastic change of esophageal squamous cells in the lower area of the esophagus, usually just above the lower esophageal sphincter. So the lower esophageal sphincter is a sphincter that closes and prevents the acidic gastric contents from refluxing up into the esophagus. Now, if there is chronic reflux, this can cause burning of the esophagus, essentially causing damage to those esophageal cells and leading to a metaplasia of those particular esophageal squamous cells that are exposed to the acidic gastric contents. And what happens is essentially those cells begin to become gastric cells. They actually become gastric glandular cells. And when this happens, this is called Barrett's esophagus. However, those new cells are going to be not as functional as the ones before. They're going to have some abnormalities. And the longer an individual has Barrett's esophagus, the more likely that one of those cells will become cancerous. So this can ultimately lead to adenocarcinoma. So those are the differences between the two types of esophageal cancer. Now let's talk about some of the risk factors for getting each of those two types of cancer. The risk factors for getting squamous cell carcinoma include the following, smoking and alcohol consumption. So smoking and alcohol consumption, you can imagine that if there's smoke when you're inhaling from smoking a cigarette, that smoke can enter into the esophagus and cause damage to those esophageal cells. And with alcohol consumption, that alcohol going down the esophagus when drinking can cause inflammation of those esophageal cells. Infection with human papillomavirus or HPV, so having infection of HPV in the throat and the esophagus can also increase the risk for esophageal cancer. A diet low in fruits and vegetables is also another risk factor for getting squamous cell carcinoma. Another important one is drinking hot liquids. So for instance, when drinking very hot tea or coffee or other hot liquids, this can essentially burn those squamous cells of the esophagus and burn the lining of the esophagus. This can lead to inflammation and eventual damage of those cells and can increase the risk for developing cancer later on in life. So it's important to let beverages cool before drinking them. Having atrophic gastritis can also be a risk factor for getting squamous cell carcinoma. 
And then having poor oral hygiene is also another risk factor as well. Now, risk factors for getting adenocarcinoma include some of those same risk factors we have just mentioned, but there are some other ones as well. So one of them, and the most important and most common, is going to be gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GERD. So having GERD, so having that chronic reflux of acidic gastric contents into the lower parts of the esophagus is going to be a major risk factor for getting adenocarcinoma. So if there's chronic reflux of gastric contents, essentially causing burning of the esophageal layer or the esophageal squamous cells, those squamous cells can eventually become another type of cell, those gastric glandular cells we talked about before leading to Barrett's esophagus. And once you get Barrett's esophagus, you're at an increased risk for getting esophageal cancer. Smoking and alcohol are also other risk factors for getting adenocarcinoma. Obesity is another risk factor. Obesity ties in with gastroesophageal reflux disease, so having a larger abdomen can cause issues with the inappropriate opening of that lower esophageal sphincter. So you can imagine that if there's pressure on the stomach, this can cause some of those gastric contents to essentially be pushed and pressured to go up into the esophagus more often. Having an infection with the bacteria H. pylori or Helicobacter pylori is also another risk factor for getting adenocarcinoma. And having had a cholecystectomy or removing your gallbladder is also another risk factor for getting adenocarcinoma as well. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of esophageal cancer. So one of the main symptoms of esophageal cancer is progressive dysphagia. So progressive dysphagia means that there is issues swallowing. Dysphagia means problem swallowing. And it's progressive because it goes from solids. So initially a patient might feel that when they swallow solids, those solids sort of get stuck. And what happens is over time, they notice that solids and liquids have issues going down. So this is what we call progressive dysphagia. So feeling like things get stuck or caught as they go down after you've consumed them, first starting with solids. So solids seem to get stuck and eventually even liquids. So if you're to drink some beverage, even the beverage, even the liquid has a difficult time going down your esophagus. That is what we call progressive dysphagia. There can also be pain with swallowing, which we call odynophagia. And what is noted is that this pain with swallowing starts out by only having pain when swallowing. But as the disease progresses, the pain becomes constant. So there can be constant pain in the area of the esophagus. So there can be some retrosternal pain that can occur and become constant when the disease progresses. There can also be regurgitation. So regurgitation is where patient essentially coughs up food and oftentimes it's going to be undigested food because it hasn't reached the stomach. And then there can also be aspiration so due to that regurgitation, that coughing up of food, that food can also be aspirated, which means that it can go down into the trachea and into the lungs. So this can lead to issues as well. We're going to talk about those in the next slide. And then because reflux or gastroesophageal reflux disease is so common, is a common risk factor for getting adenocarcinoma, patients can often have had a past history of chronic or long-standing reflux or GERD, so they may have GERD symptoms as well. Hematemesis can also occur in these patients, so vomiting up of blood. There can be bleeding from the esophagus itself, and that blood can go into the stomach, become digested, and then it can be defecated into the stool, and it becomes black in coloration. And this is what we call melina. So melina is a black, tarry, and often smelly stool. Anemia can also occur as well. You can imagine that if you're losing blood from bleeding of the esophagus due to cancer in the esophagus, you're going to have a low blood count as well. Because this is a cancer, there is constitutional symptoms that can happen in this cancer as well. These include fatigue, night sweats. So oftentimes it can be drenching night sweats and there can be weight loss as well. And then some other signs and symptoms of esophageal cancer include a dry cough, and this may be caused by the aspiration itself. So patient might cough and aspirate that 
food into their trachea and into their lungs, and that can lead to some dry cough, but it can also be due to aspiration pneumonia. So because there is food that actually gets into the trachea and into the lungs, this can cause a lung infection. This is what we call aspiration pneumonia, and this can happen in patients with esophageal cancer as well. And there can also be hoarseness of voice. So if particular areas of the esophagus are affected by the cancer, this can cause issues where it leads to compression or issues with the larynx. So this can cause hoarseness of voice, and this can be a sign of esophageal cancer as well. How is esophageal cancer diagnosed? So clinicians diagnose esophageal cancer by several different mechanisms. One I'll bring up here is barium swallow. Although it's not typically used, barium swallow is when a patient swallows barium and then there is imaging done. It's not a good test, but if it is done, it may show narrowing of the esophagus. The best test or the best way to diagnose esophageal cancer is through endoscopy with biopsy. And then some other tests can be performed, including endoscopic ultrasound, and then other imaging modalities to assess for metastases as well. So CT scan, bone scan, or PET scan can be performed to assess if there are metastases in other places in the body. Once a clinician has diagnosed esophageal cancer, how is it treated? So if it is very early on in cancer progression, if it's only superficial and it's limited to the mucosa of the esophagus, oftentimes endoscopic resection is going to be employed. So using an endoscope and then taking and resecting that lesion. If the lesions have penetrated into the submucosa, so beyond the mucosa into the submucosa, oftentimes there's going to be surgical resection. So an esophagectomy can be performed with a lymphadenectomy or a removal of the lymph node. And this is often going to show negative lymph nodes. And then if the lesion has invaded the muscularis propria with affected lymph nodes, oftentimes it's going to require surgical resection with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And then if it's metastatic disease, so if it's spread out into other parts of the body, it's going to be palliative care. And some other methods of treating metastatic disease can be esophageal stent. There can be chemotherapy or radiation that can also be performed as well to help reduce some of the symptoms of the disease itself. And then what is noted is that combination therapy is better than surgery alone. So this is a quick overview of treatments of esophageal carcinoma. So if you want to learn more about other types of gastroenterology diseases, please check my full playlist on those topics. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.